Florida based small fleet owner Chris Porcelli started his cat trucking company as a one truck business. He was still in his 20s and struggled for the first six months. But 11 years into it today, the five truck fleet has excelled in north south LTL reefer lanes with mostly direct customers for produce headed north from Florida and south Georgia and a bevy of commodities headed south. I'm Todd Dills, your host for this September 9th, 2022 edition of Overdrive Radio where you'll hear owner Porcelli run through his story in a conversation recorded in August, attended to his company's semi-finalist recognition in Overdrive's 2022 Small Fleet Championship. CAP, CAP, trucking is uh, one of five semi-finalists in the 3 to 10 truck category for the program this year, with five more contenders also in the 11 to 30 truck category. We're running stories about all 10 of the fleets through September at overdriveonline.com slash small hyphen Fleet hyphen champ. Finalists will be announced in early October, with the winner named in a ceremony at the annual conference of the National Association of Small Trucking Companies, held October 20 through 22 in Nashville. Here, so we're pretty much produce from October 15th through August, yeah. and so that's you know, 10 months out of the year, and. Um, August, September, beginning of October, not so much produce floating around where we will run, but we will do some local work in New Jersey to New York with produce to to the market. Um, That's our mainstay northbound freight. Coming south, we primarily haul liquor, wine, and refrigerated and frozen meats and and perishables. So it could be anything from beef to chicken, turkey, um, some sort of, um, we bring down some healthy juices to supermarket chains, um, you know, frozen meats and hamburgers and stuff like that. Right. And that's our, that's our, our main haul coming south is the, the frozen and fresh LTL. Chris Porcelli's clearly got an acumen for all the planning and thinking that goes into consolidation of LTL loads. And his family's lineage extends back four generations in the wholesale produce business at Hunts Point Market, in New York City where he cut his teeth as a night receiving foreman in the family produce business before venturing into over-the-road trucking in the early part of the last decade. Getting to where he is today was in no way an easy path for the young man, though, and recent years have presented the trifecta of difficulties with a stolen truck. I'm thinking it got impounded. You know, I'm thinking, like, it got towed because they saw it at at a hotel. And I said, well, everything's gone. He says, no, the trailer's still here. The truck's gone. And he said, he says, Chris, the GPS is on the grass. I just, I just found it. An expensive brush with scam artists. It was the first time in 10 years that I got beat for money from a customer. And a feeling of just being overworked that led him to start choices that have allowed the business to reemerge all the better for it. I scaled back, I wound up dissolving the brokerage recently, taking on some of that freight ourselves direct and just basically giving out whatever I couldn't handle. We'll dive into Cap Trucking's history all the way back from the beginning with Chris Porcelli himself after this quick message from Overdrive Radio's sponsor. Where do the greats of the trucking industry belong? In the Howes Hall of Fame. Do you know a person, place, or organization that deserves to be recognized for their outstanding work? Nominate them today. Howes, makers of the nation's top diesel additives for over 100 years, has been adding amazing inductees into its new digital Hall of Fame, and now they want to hear from you. Become a part of the fun and excitement by submitting your nomination when you visit the Howes Hall of Fame at howesproducts.com. That's Howes, H-O-W-E-S, howesproducts.com. And I'll say the virtual Howes Hall of Fame is truly something to behold. Among members are longtime truck drivers and owners, trucking radio personalities like Red Eye Radio's Eric Harley, plenty more. I know they'd appreciate your nomination. Okay, here's Cap Trucking owner, Chris Porcelli, taking us back to the beginning. I was born in New Jersey and uh, actually worked in the Hunts Point Produce Market in New York before getting into this. Uh, So my father, it's uh, third generation with him, fourth with me. It's a wholesale produce company. So that's how I got into logistics. Uh, We used to receive in trucks all night long with fresh produce and then deliver it to restaurants, supermarkets, chains, et cetera, in the New York City area. I was a receiving foreman there. 
Yeah, it was night shift. I used to start at 5.30 p.m. at night, and I used to work till about 4 o'clock in the morning, sleep and do it all over again Sunday yeah. through Thursday night. Mm-hmm. Long hours. Business is still going on. My dad's still still running it. That would be Ciro Porcelli, third generation leader of the Jerry Porcelli Produce Company. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a customer yeah. seven months out of the year with, with produce. So I was working for my dad and I was doing some local runs for a friend of mine at the time. And I think I wanted something a little bit more than just working nights in New York City. And yeah. um, so I'd asked my dad for some more management positions uh, that were open with him. And he basically said I was too young and he wanted somebody yeah. older in there and all that and kind of pushed me away. So I started, I wanted to buy a house and everything in New Jersey at the time and still was yeah. very expensive. So I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to reverse this. I'm going to keep renting because I had a real cheap place in, in North Jersey and I bought a house in Florida. And okay. I said, I got it for a good price and I'm either going to rent it out or it'll just be a vacation home, but I can't really touch anything in Jersey right now for what I want to spend. So right. fast forward about a year after I bought the house in Florida, I wasn't really getting anywhere in New York with either a raise or a new position. So I went for my CDLA, I got it, and I had some money saved up. So I said, I'm going to go buy something. So I bought a used truck out of uh, Atlanta okay. and I bought a used trailer that was involved in a rollover accident that I fixed. And I started trucking. It was a disaster <laughs> for six <laughs> months. <laughs> it was a disaster. Yeah. And I thought I was going to be driving back to New York one of those times to just start working there again. Mm-hmm. And um, little by little, it started coming around. And I um, was able to get into a new truck after a couple of years. And that really turned things around. Little by little, I got up to... Um, seven trucks at one point and scaled back just a little bit and five seemed to be the magical number and okay. then uh, I'll trip lease some guys in the winter time when it's busy for us and they'll either rent a trailer or just trip lease with their own and um, that that seems to be the the sweet spot for us right now okay. so you know I know guys that have tried to get me to add more trucks to the fleet but I I, I don't I don't believe in uh, yeah. quantity over quality <laughs> in sure. my instance, at least. I mean, what, what is it? What's it when you say it's a sweet spot for you? I mean, what, what are your uh, parameters for being a sweet spot? Is it just the uh, ability, your personal ability to keep up with everything, maybe? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I have a dispatcher and fuel tax person that works with me part time. She gives me about 25 hours a week and um, she helps, you know, with communicating with the drivers and, you know, making phone calls to the customers, et cetera which takes some pressure off of me. I have a 13 month old son, so he's, uh, can be a handful, you know, right. times my wife works. So, you know, he goes to daycare a few days a week. He stays home with us a few days a week, try and split it, everything up. So that was a sweet spot because right before COVID hit and all that jazz, I had an office in Sanford with a warehouse. I was driving like 35 minutes each way. And I was, had a brokerage at the time. So we were brokering out about five to 10 loads a week. I was running my five to six trucks a week. And, you know, after a while I was like, man, this is a lot. I was not sleeping. I was not, you know, doing anything healthy. I gained a lot of weight and I was like, this is not good. So we scaled back. I wound up dissolving the brokerage recently, taking on some of that freight ourselves direct and just basically giving out whatever I couldn't handle. And um, monetarily, you know, it seems to be where where I'd like to be, you know, Mm -hmm. running this many trucks. Um, I'll always yearn for more. But uh, at some point you become, you know, content, let's say, and, um, you know, stick with that. Mm -hmm. So I try to be consistent. You know, we we run pretty much contracted freight um for the same customers so you know we go through our busy seasons and slow seasons and ebbs and flows with that this is technically our slow season from literally now until about the first week in october so the next six or seven weeks it's a little bit quieter for us as noted earlier we were speaking in early august as may be obvious to the Um, attentive listener you plan and budget for it like anything else um 
But yeah, I mean, especially with the market right now, it's so volatile with truck prices and rates and fuel and everything. It's, you know, I don't know if I'd be out there buying three to five trucks, you know, right now at the prices they want and, you know, trying to find some good drivers to put in them. So it's become a sweet spot where we're at. It wasn't by any stretch an easy road to get there, though. And poor Chelly traces the beginnings of a fork in the road for him back to 2019, just pre-COVID, with his workload at its very highest. Actually, 2019, as if I wasn't doing enough with brokering and running the trucks, I took on a salesman position at a farm that we (laughs) direct for. And I was selling produce for them uh, for about five, six months, I guess. Okay. I was living in a hotel with a <laughs> dog five days a week down there trying to sell produce, making money with them, driving back up to my office on the weekends, cleaning up all the paperwork from my secretary, <laughs> checking out the warehouse that we had downstairs, making sure everything was good there, going home for a day, doing laundry, going back out, doing it again. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah, you're making money, but this is asinine. <laughs> this is absolutely crazy. Right. I had to walk away from selling and produce and had to walk away from brokering as many loads as I was brokering and just yeah. cleaned it up, you know, just cleaned it up and took what was yielding me the most revenue and profit and ran with it, you yeah. know, and uh, the biggest thing that I wanted to do, because at some point, you know, around year five or six in business, I, um, you know, had a pretty substantial amount of business debt. And uh, the biggest thing I wanted to do in the most recent years was consolidate that. You know, I wanted to eliminate as much of that as possible, pay off equipment, you know, et cetera, and therefore see a a better return at the end of the year. I wanted to have at least half of the fleet paid off. You know, that was, it was, and it wasn't a business tact that I was after following when I say that. Um, But I just, in my mind, if, you know, if I could take, seven trailers and you know five trucks and say okay 12 pieces of equipment six of them are paid off i've got six basically generating income you know on top of that you know you balance it all out to me that was a good standard to at least run with for about a year or two yeah build up some escrow build up you know some savings and then okay i'm I'm ready to go out and and buy two trailers i'm I'm ready to buy two trucks you know whatever um Tomorrow, I'm actually flying to Dallas. Yeah, we're looking at some trailers out there because I'm sure, as you know, equipment right now is just insane. Yeah. And um, I've got a, a new custom 54-foot multi-temp that was being built from March of 21. I just got the purchase order two days ago. I gave <laughs> them a deposit in March of 21. Purchase order was sent to me on Monday the 8th um had no clue what the price was going to be till then and now they're telling me the trailer might be done december if not definitely by january so so it's like what it's two years later right yeah (laughs) Yeah, and you know listen i'm i'm fine with it you know it's what i need for what we haul it's a multi-temp trailer we do a lot of ltl so i need split temps um so you have uh dual temps and tri temps we only run dual temps um so some of our trailers are single temps but we don't we don't go up to tri temps was what i meant um the way that works is you can haul something frozen and something fresh yeah so we do a lot of that with our ltl consolidation where we'll have dry freight and we'll have refrigerated freight we'll have frozen freight we'll have refrigerated meat or juice so take a 53 foot trailer you can pretty much split it up however you want and bulkhead it and you've got your zone one and your zone two and everything gets monitored the biggest thing i did about two years ago was convert all the trailers over to tracking and now i can monitor all the temperatures of all the trailers and how fast they're going and when they need fuel and all that stuff i mean you name it it tells you what the trailer's doing and um that has been a a huge help because Sometimes I'm able to tell a driver there's a problem before he even knows, you know, he could be on the road, on the phone, talking to his wife and I get a code texted to me. I call him up. Hey, you got a problem. He can pull over before he even, you know, knew there was an issue. Did the driver have the opportunity to get those um, 
those alerts too, though, I imagine. Yeah. Just might and not see them if they're on the road. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Thermo King is the the holder yeah. of the um, the program. It's called Track King, so okay. Track and then capital K like Thermo King. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's uh, you can use it. You can utilize it on on online. You can yeah. download an app to your phone, and when you set up the alerts as the owner or dispatcher, what have you, you can set it up to email or text specific people. Yeah. So because my, some of my guys drop and hook trailers. You know, it wouldn't be fair to just sign them up for all these alerts. Yeah. Well, I've got one driver that pretty much pulls the same trailer. So for him, I let him just get the alerts. But, um, you know, for the most part, it comes directly to my dispatcher and myself. Yeah. And if she's working, she'll grab it. If not, I'll grab it. And um, that's that's how that works. The, one of the biggest reasons why I went with it was because... And we don't get claims a lot, but when we did, you'd have to drive to Thermo King to get a download to prove where your set point was and what your return air was for the load. And number one, you've got driver time, fuel, truck wear and tear. You get to Thermo King, you have to wait for them to plug in and print it out, email it to you. They charge you about 160 bucks, give or take. Half the time, if you're in the right, the customer will reimburse you the 160 bucks, but I can't build them an extra 200 bucks for my driver's time and, and fuel. Right. So um, this program, which costs me, I mean, a fraction of that per trailer, it's like, I don't know, $30 a trailer per month, let's say. I'm able to get a download whenever I want any trailer inclusive yeah. of the program. So it saves me and the drivers a ton of expenses. It was, it was a no brainer to, to make that. And there's multiple platforms that offer this service now. Yeah. Carrier has theirs, Thermo King has theirs. There's a third party company called iBright, not cheap, but very thorough. Tells you when the doors are open on the trailer, right. when they're closed, which really helps if you're sitting at a loading dock, you know, for 10 hours, you know, you can prove, hey, my doors were open for 10 hours. Your product might be warm, you know. There's a lot of cool, there's some cool features with this stuff now that can really help protect the trucker that I, you know, I think if you are willing to spend the money, which it's not a lot, it's, it's a big investment in the long term. As I intimated up top, cap trucking owner Chris Porcelli has been investing in that long term more and more of late. With some big shifts in the business last year that, in some ways, hinge on the story of his at the time flagship rig. A beauty of a 2015 custom Pete 389 glider he dedicated to his grandfather. Angelo Porcelli, who passed on around the time of the purchase of the rig in 2016. So I drove that truck for the first two or three years that I had it and um, hired a driver, it's still with me now. Uh, he's been with me about five or six years, um, was in the Marines. He, um, you know, a little bit younger than me. He uh, came out of the Marines. He was working for a company in North Florida. And, you know, we met up one night at a truck stop, started talking, et cetera. I said, yeah, I'm starting to, you know, hire drivers and this and that. Right. Trying to find the right person to drive this truck, et cetera. So um, anyway, I wound up hiring him. Um, fast forward, however many years it was, um, three, I would assume four. Um, he would take the truck home sometimes. He lived outside of Jacksonville. And um, he was under a load. He had a brand new trailer. Stainless steel, 53-foot utility trailer. Wow, yeah, beautiful one, right? <laughs> with a, a load of frozen bread inside. Um, the thing was, the load had to pick up on a Friday, but it didn't deliver till a Monday. And where he was loading to where he lives, I said, look, it would make a lot more sense if you just took the truck with you. Because at yeah. the time, we were parking at this hotel. We knew the manager, et cetera. So it was real quiet. There was a, a sheriff station, like diagonally across the street, a hospital. I'm like, yeah, this can't be a terrible area. I was wrong. Um, he went there with the load, parked it. He wasn't, he checked on the truck that Sunday morning. By Sunday evening, the truck was gone. Uh. He he got in Monday morning, four or five o'clock, I don't know, five o'clock in the morning, let's say. And he called me and he said, the truck's gone. I'm thinking it got impounded. You know, I'm thinking like it got towed because they saw it at a, at a hotel. And I said, well, well, everything's gone. He says, no, the trailer's still here. The truck's gone. Wow. Well, then, then my antennas went up 
And he said, he almost started crying. He says, Chris, the GPS is on the grass. I just, I just found it. Uh. So anyway, the hotel wound up playing back the security footage. And at the time, and even still to this day, there was, there was a crew going around South Georgia, North Florida. They were driving um, a black Ford dually diesel pickup truck, all tinted out, had Texas license plates on it. Well, they wound up finding this truck and finding some sort of, you know, house that they were using somewhere in the woods of Florida. And it looked like a gone in 60 seconds wall of cars, except they were trucks. Wow. And they had pictures of guys that I know with beautiful, beautiful rides sitting there in truck stops and rest areas at receiving places. They had pictures of these trucks. Wow. And on there was a picture of two of mine. So I wound up using that information to tell a few of my friends, hey, like your truck's hot, like they they got you, you know, like watch yourself. And we were all on our, I mean, my guys were scared for a few weeks. I mean, nobody wanted to even drive or park the truck. They were scared, you know, of being held up or, you know, whatever. So it was a scary time. And um, I, my, my wife was pregnant at the time. And uh, it was just a bad time for me. I, you know, I paid the truck off after four years of owning it. I got the truck and I didn't know this at the time, but I bought the truck on the day my grandfather passed away. Okay. So inside the truck, I had a plaque made where the Peterbilt, you know, side is in the passenger side of the uh, air ducts. And it said custom built for, and it had my grandfather's name on it. And um, I did that first run up to New York myself. And uh, my dad told me that he had passed away in the hospital when I got there. Oh, man. I got the truck. So I was like, man, you know, truck had a lot of sentimental value to me. Yeah. Uh, goes without say. Uh, we had put it in a few truck shows down here in Florida. I yep. had you know, put a lot of time and effort into it. Um, you know, the driver kept it clean. It was, you know, everybody knew me, knew that truck. Um, never recovered. Insurance offered me an insult of an offer on it. I said, you can keep your claim. Um, I'm not going to even put that on my record for three years and be penalized for it because it's not going to buy the truck back. It wasn't even close to buying the truck back. Um, I was a mess, though. I, I rode around on my motorcycle and my pickup. I probably covered every square inch of Florida in a few <laughs> days. I mean, looking all over. And wow. I even had two people try and blackmail me for. Five hundred or a thousand dollars. Fast forward a few months, saying they knew where the truck was. It was in Georgia. It was in the woods. It was this. It was that. We sent cops up there. I had a private investigator. Right. I mean, we did the whole nine yards, and it had never turned up. But in my mind, I'm thinking it's a pretty unique color. It was called yeah. diamond white metallic. It wasn't a super popular color for Peterbilt for the year. Yeah. And you'll see, it's kind of like a cream color. You know, you'll see them out there, but there's not a ton of them. It's not a pearl white. And, yeah. um, you know, it, it just, it really, what caught me by surprise was they left the trailer. I mean, yeah. every bit of a $90,000 trailer, trailers are a lot easier to get rid of than trucks in the theft industry. So yeah. it's like, you left that, but you took the truck, you know, yeah. and, and it just, fast yeah. forward, now I have totally hidden GPSs in the trucks, GPSs yeah. in the trailers. I even spent... God, probably five or six thousand installing these um these chip keys. I don't think I have one on me handy right now, but there are these additional keys that have to go in the truck in addition to the the actual ignition key. And it actually, if that key is not in, the fuel pump and the starter will not turn on. So if somebody tries to hotwire it, it's not gonna work. If somebody has a spare key made because they steal the VIN, it's not gonna work. So, yeah, I had to, I, I was so paranoid and probably would be a liar if I didn't say I still am now. <laughs> right. I did it to all my personal vehicles. I, you know, I had a brand new pickup. My wife was driving a relatively new Jeep. I had them done. You know, I mean, every single vehicle that had my name in it, the guy came and he did it. Right. And um, I almost, and I mean, pretty close i almost walked away from this business after that truck got stolen i just didn't have it in me it sounds like that is also involved with your rethinking of uh 
you know, the size of the business and Absolutely. the and everything that all kind of happened around the same. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It, it's, it's hard to, to have the energy to go out there. And I mean, this trip that I'm taking tomorrow is probably the first, well, it's probably the third time if I'm going to be technical, but in the last two years, you know, that I've really ventured out and been like, okay, I'm going to go look at some equipment. Yeah. I used to go all the time, you know, I mean, all the time I, I'd be yeah. driving my truck down the road because, you know, I used to drive full time up until just a few years ago. Yep. I'd be driving a truck down the road. I'd see a dealership with something. I'd, I'd pull over and just kick tires and look just to figure out what things were going for, you know, what the values were of stuff. Last year, I wound up buying uh, two used trucks. I had, I had to drive to Iowa to get one. I flew to Pittsburgh, look at another. And then I wound up buying another one in Mississippi at the truck market. And, you know, I, I wound up using them for a little bit and then I'll fix them up and then I'll flip them and make some money and then replace them with something else. You know, I've got my my steady Bettys, as I call them, that they like their nice trucks and I just keep them in it. I got a couple guys that don't care, you know, they work local or whatever and they just want a clean, nice truck. So I use that as a means to, you know, get my write offs and buy equipment and sell equipment and what have you. But, yeah, that. That whole era just really, it shook me. I, I can't even yeah. hide it. You know, it was a bad time. My wife being pregnant did not help. I, at the time, had been in <clears throat> business 10 years. Now I'm 11, going on 12. And um, it was the first time in 10 years that I got beat for money from a customer. Okay. And I'm still in legal deposition with him. Um, so it was just a rough six months. You know, it was not fun. You can read more about that period in our Monday, September 5 profile of Cap Trucking if you missed it via the Small Fleet Champ section of OverdriveOnline.com, where four of our eventual 10 award semifinalist stories have been published as of today. Find it at OverdriveOnline.com slash small hyphen fleet hyphen champ. Keep tuned to it through the end of this month to read about all the fleets. For Chris Porcelli, all that came to a head engendering a refocusing of his business priorities a little more than a year ago, when, when his and his wife Lauren's child was born. Here's Porcelli picking up the story on a bit of an extended stay they had in the hospital around the birth. Part of the time spent arguing with these guys to pay me. Uh. And it became such a personal vendetta. And I, I, I remember driving home after two weeks with my wife and son in the back and i told her i said i have no energy to do this anymore <laughs> they've taken my my truck my beautiful paid off truck that i worked my butt uh, for. they've just beat me for almost twenty one thousand dollars from this customer here i have uh, no desire to wake up and do this again tomorrow and between her and my father they pretty much slapped me around till i had some <laughs> sense knocked into me that you still have good customers and you still have good yeah. employees and you still have this you know Every business takes a hit, you right. know, and just, just, you know, if it took 10 years for you to get to this point, then take it in stride and run with it, you know? And, uh, I did, but, you know, I still went forward with the lawsuit against them, even though it's probably not going to get me my money back. And if it does, the lawyers are going to get 30% of it off the hop, but it's principle, you yeah. know, like, why should I just let you get away with these three or four loads that we hauled for you? Yeah, You know, and fast forward, come to find out this guy was not venturing out into any sort of new business venture. He was scamming people that he told yeah. he was moving furniture for. <laughs> I have this problem where when people piss me off, I just work really, really hard. <laughs> so we wound up moving a lot of freight last year. Yeah. And um, yeah, we had a great year last year. Of course, a lot of things were inflated. So. Yeah. You know, by the time you factor in fuel surcharge and all that, your numbers are up, but your expenses were up, you know. Yeah. So it's like if you take my consistent 1.6 to 1.8 million dollar years and then add in an additional, let's say, 100, 200,000 in fuel and then add on fuel surcharge on top of that. Now you get a 2.1 to 2.3 yeah. million dollar year. Did you really knock it out of the park? You know, you might have made a little bit extra money, you know, yeah. but your expenses were up 
You know, I mean, that's nope. really what it came down to. If you can stay consistent, though, if you can match what your expenses are and beat it, then yeah, I guess yeah. I guess you're doing well. You know, so do you end up um, working with brokers on the way back uh, for a lot of the guys that are kind of going out? Or I actually was thinking work? about this because I was trying to trying to figure it out. About fifteen percent, upwards, no more than twenty percent of my work is through brokers. Okay, everything else is direct. Gotcha. So yeah, like this time of year, I'm dealing with brokers more frequently right. to get out of Florida, get out of Georgia and yep. north. But almost all our freight coming back down is direct. And seven to eight months out of the year, I'll say eight, all of our freight leaving Florida is direct. So for that three to four month period of time where we're looking for loads one way, yeah. that's my broker freight. So it, it accounts for no more than 20%. Right. Um, and it's very difficult to deal with brokers nowadays. It, it amazes me that with fuel at the price it's at and expenses at where they're at, tires, brakes, et cetera, how they're getting away with these rates. Right. Thankfully, most of our stuff is dedicated freight that pays very consistent and or fuel surcharge gets applied you yeah. know, correctly. So at the end of the day, I'm, we're not sweating it too much, but we still have a minimum we need to meet, you know, one way. Right. And it's amazing to me what these people want to pay. I mean, I, right. I don't know how trucking companies that only deal with the load boards are making it. I noticed that you said that you were um, you were going to move into an S corp uh, yes. type structure. Yes. Um, what prompted that? Uh, taxes. Yeah. Um, you know, basically right now and for the last 10 and a half years, whatever it's been, um, you know, I've been following under a 1040 S. Um, I'm W-2 to my LLC, but at the end of the day, I'm still a, a single member. So you're basically just a sole proprietor yeah. at the end of the day, um, you know, with all the assets that I have. And I don't really know, like, when I surpassed it, but at some point, I guess, when you've got a fair amount of, of trucks or trailers, whatever their worth is, let's say. Um, it becomes more beneficial if you're an S corp to them. Yeah. So um, my accountant actually wanted me to switch over back in 2020, I think. Uh, it's been about two years or three years. He's been bugging me to do it. Right. And between COVID and my wife being pregnant and all that, I was just like, man, I don't have the stomach for it. You know, right. we're just going to have to figure this out. I'm not buying anything big. You know, I already have our homes, we have cars, you know, I'm, I, I, nobody questions, you know, the integrity of my paycheck. So right, it's like, right. I'm not rushing for this, but I do understand the tax benefit. So we officially formed the company in May. So as we speak right now, Horacelli Trucking, DBA, Cap Trucking is open. Um, not a dollar has been passed through it yet. Um, at the end of this month, August, that's when our license plates renew on the trucks in the state yeah, of Florida. Okay. So with our IFTA IRP account, that's when we're going to switch everything over to the new cap trucking. So I did the doing business as cap trucking so that virtually nothing would have to change. You're just eliminating yeah. the LLC. Right. Because, uh, you know, we got to do decals on the trucks, decals on the trailers. You know, my bank account is all set up now. But, um, yeah, so that was the prompt. I'm the only gotcha. owner to the business, but I basically wanted it to be incorporated uh, so that at the end of the year, I can do what I want with the, uh, the write-offs and yeah. the expenditures and whatnot. The S-Corp structure allows for tax savings in a couple of different ways, as we've noted in prior coverage. Catch my how-to from fall 2021 on setting up the business that way, including details on considerations to make related to why, when, and just how to do it via a story you'll find a link to in the show notes with this podcast or the post that houses it at overdriveonline.com slash overdrive hyphen radio. It's the September 9th, 2022 edition. Here's a big thanks to Chris Porcelli for his time. You can check out all our small fleet champ semifinalists for this year via overdriveonline.com slash small hyphen fleet hyphen champ all throughout the rest of this month. Here's good luck to all the contenders. Overdrive Radio is a production of Overdrive, the voice of the American trucker. Set it and produced by me, Todd Dills, with the acoustic guitar and other support of trucker songwriter and Overdrive contributor, Long Haul Paul Marhofer. 
theme is Legend of the Snake Man by Lamar Hofer, featuring the guitar work of Travis the Snake Man himself, Womack. Terry Two Socks Richardson on bass, keys by Tishmingo Jim Whitehead, and on drums, Mr. Andrew Marshall. The podcast is backed up further by Overdrive's own news editor, Matt Cole, social media coordinator, Holly Young, and executive editor, Alex Lyle. Until next time, keep it broadly.